Welcome to the Startup Grind. All right, let's do this. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, a little about Startup Grind, if this is your first time here. Startup Grind is an event series uh, powered by, global, uh, by Google for Entrepreneurs, uh, designed to inspire, educate, and connect entrepreneurs. Today, we have Mother Isa, founder and CEO of MyU. Uh, let's kick it off with um, you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, firstly, tell us uh, about how MyU was born. What gave you the idea? Sure. First of all, good evening. I'm happy to be here. Uh, thank you, Sardar, for hosting me. Um, and I, before addressing the question, I like to take, you know, get an idea of the type of audience that I'm talking to. Uh, so raise your hand if you work for the government. Okay. One person from the government. <laughs> raise your hand if you work uh, at a large organization. All right. And if you are in a small or medium business, okay, the people who didn't raise their hands, jobless. <laughs> <laughs> Students, okay, perfect, yes. That, uh, I missed that, that part, uh, ironically. Ironically. So uh, how we started MyU, it was back in 2013, um, that's when the idea was sparked. Uh, it was very unconventional. I'd be uh, lying to you if I, if I said that, you know, out of the blue, I was like, okay, let's develop my you, let's do my you. Uh, it progressed over time. In the beginning, I wasn't sure. Um, I was inspired um, at the time by how social networks changed everyone's lives, right? If you remember back in 2013, what do you do? You know, do you remember what device you used at the time? 2012, 2013, huh? BlackBerry. You know, the, the funny thing about BlackBerry, I I graduated in 2011, right? So I used to study in uh, in the states, and uh, throughout the time that I was a student, I would actually buy a prepaid uh, card to be able to contact my parents. Uh, up until, I think, 2010, 2011, which was my graduation year, and all of a sudden I hear about this phone through which you can message someone else uh, without having to pay for SMS, right? So I call my mom, you, you have to buy this phone, uh, we'll be able, I'll be able to message you, I can send pictures, and you know, all of that. That wasn't a long time ago since many of you also mentioned BlackBerry in 2012, 2000, and probably 13. In 2013, I bought my iPhone, my first iPhone. And if you remember, in 2012, 2013, this is when Twitter was booming in Kuwait, right? Uh, and for the first time, people, you know, were able to connect with a bigger circle than the circle they knew, right? Before that, it was through news, through watching TV. That's when you hear opinions. That's where you see other people, or you're, you're confined to your own circles, family, friends, etc. your own social circles, right? But for the first time ever, uh, you were able to reach out and connect and view, uh, you know, someone else's standpoint who could be outside of, of your environment, right? So that actually inspired me so much. Um, and then, you know, Instagram came about and, you know, all the you know, the boom that came uh, with, with these social uh, networks. Um, so I felt I wanted to be a part of this change. I wanted to do something that helps people connect online, just like how these tools helped many people form communities online, right, for the first time. Uh, and I thought maybe why not, why not think of doing something like that? Uh, you know, so I started digging into it, doing some research, analyzing the situation a little bit. Um, and, you know, what we noticed, or what I noticed at the time, is that social networks maybe are similar in functions, but they're very different in the type of environment they create and the type of audience that they allow to connect. What I mean is, if you look at all the social networks, the functionality is almost the same. Right? The architecture is probably a little bit different, 
And by doing that, they make it more comfortable for certain audiences to connect. Example, what kind of audience do you connect with through Facebook, Instagram, or uh, WhatsApp? Family friends, right? Twitter, do you connect with friends on Twitter? Maybe to a lesser extent, huh? But who do you connect with on Twitter, mostly? It's a big, kind of a, a wider circle. A wider circle of politics, news, um, you know, a, a social circle that's bigger than your uh, normal social circle. Economics, it's the public profile of everyone. That's what Twitter evolved to become, right? Uh, now, do you connect with your friends on LinkedIn? No, we, no. It's business. It's, a, it's, an, uh, it's an, a professional social networks. It helps professionals connect and form communities online and engage. And for deals to happen, for businesses to collaborate, all of that. It, it's not so much the functionality but what they've been able to build with time and the culture they've, they've been able to bring into the platform. So we looked at that, and then we thought that there was, there was one gap within this whole spectrum. Uh, connecting learning communities. People who want to engage online because they want to learn something. Those communities exist in schools, they exist in universities, and they exist in learning institutions in general. Maybe in companies, maybe on the cloud, Maybe there isn't any physical institution, but it's a learning community. They need a special type of engagement. They engage in a certain way. They're not friends. They're not yet professional colleagues, right? Uh, they collaborate in a different way. And this is how we evolved as MyU. And this is you know, the kind of the niche segment that we wanted to target and, and to, grow, uh, to grow the platform with. So back in 2000, did I elaborate so much? <laughs> <laughs> so that was back in 2013. Um, uh, that's when the first idea uh, came about. We, you know, that's when I wrote the first uh, you know, thing on paper and made the first sketches, right? Uh, we launched the app in 2014. It was the iPhone app first. The Android came four months later. Um, it was a horrible app. It was an app that I wouldn't use. No, I don't, I don't think anyone, no one actually used uh, the first version, which lasted for six months. I think I was very patient to wait six months for one person to start using the app. Uh, but I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure we will touch upon uh, the different aspects of developing it uh, after that stage. But then we grew from one user to a few tens of, tens of users, to hundreds of users, to thousands of users. Um, we had at one point 500 daily users, and then we jumped that to, th to 2,000 daily users, and then 5,000, and then 10,000, and then 30,000, 60,000, and today we stand at 80,000 daily uh, active users. That's awesome. Uh, what were the challenges you faced, though, when you launched the app? Uh, I mean, if you're, if you're running a small business, or rather a startup, which is even more uh, tricky than, than a small business, you run into different challenges, many, many challenges throughout the way. Um, but the ones that stand out that are, I would say, constant, that you will always, um, they will be, always be faced with, I think uh, primarily finding the right people. The people who can join you, believe in your vision, uh, be willing to take the struggle, be willing to accept uncertainty, uh, be willing to understand, uh, you know, the startup and take it as if it's their own and work under a very, you know, very random, very unsystematic circumstances and take that forward. Those are very, very, very rare. Finding these people are, is, a, is a very, very difficult task. So I think that is really the thing that stands out in terms of challenges. And I think, you know, for the people, for the many entrepreneurs here, the last category who raised their hand. Let's, let's do one more time because I see many people who came. Anyone here runs a startup or is part of a small business? Okay, so I'm pretty sure you guys relate to what I'm saying uh, to a greater extent. So let's touch on your uh, educational background. You have 
a degree in environmental engineering, mm -hmm. and you worked at KOC. Yes. So, what made, and then you shifted gears to build Mayu. Mm. So, what led to the switch? Um, so, I did my bachelor's in environmental engineering, right? Um, it's what we call Blikwait Tachassus Nadir, a rare, um, uh, you know, specialization, which most of the time is, you know, it's, it's a rare uh, specialization and it's something that everyone wants. Uh, and I was one of the uh, very lucky individuals whom um, my job title in the oil sector at Kuwait Oil Company actually matched with my education. Because most of the time, those two don't match. You study uh, finance, you end up in HR, you probably study, um, you know, industrial engineering. You end up drilling, uh, drilling uh, wells, uh, vice versa. Right? I was the lucky one, one of the, you know, probably the rare five percent of the employees whom those two matched. Uh, nonetheless, I didn't see that I was progressing. Uh, it wasn't. It was a very slow-paced job for me. Right. Uh, it didn't involve any engineering. I, so I it just I didn't connect. I think uh, a month through my uh, career at KOC, I decided that you know this is not for me and I need to leave. It's just it was just a matter of time. I did spend four years there after that, but uh, then I decided to 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 quit. Uh, but I mean, it was uh, probably an inner drive. Uh, for me to do something, to create something, uh, a passion that I had, and I didn't feel that my job was fulfilling what I wanted to be for myself as a person and, you know, for what my future uh, should be and how I imagined it to be. So, yeah. so you mentioned that you struggled with the first version of your app, like mm -hmm. launching it. So when and how, and most people do, like whether it's their app or their product or any other project, even a book. Uh, so when and how did you decide that the first version was ready enough to launch like oh, so I'm going to go with this? So how many have actually seen my you today? Okay, the students. <laughs> All right. So my you today is a, a learning social network. All right, it's a social network. You, you, develop, you develop a profile and you, collect, you connect with um, with other people in your learning institution. Um, they could be students or could be a, the, your educator, your professor or your, your teacher. And you engage, you collaborate, you share uh, documents, um, you ask questions. It's a collaborative learning environment, right? Um, so how it was built, the first phase was actually, uh, like I said, we, we launched something um, and it was very difficult for us to launch. But I think what helped us actually move beyond uh, thinking of it momentarily into you know, uh, thinking about the vision and, and decide to take the risk, what helped us do that is we were part of uh, the acceleration program that um, Brilliant Lab, along with um, Uzarat Shabab, the Ministry of Youth, have organized at Silicon Valley. It was an amazing program, one of the best programs that I've attended. And there I was introduced to the concept of uh, the lean uh, startup method, right? Which is when you launch before being ready to launch, right? Not waiting for the perfect moment, right? So that helped us go through, uh, you know, that mental and uh, psychological, uh, you know, barrier and decide to, to, to launch the app. Now, the, the first app that launched uh, was an app where you know students and teachers could register. Students can't post; they can only view. Teachers post, and everyone else views. That was the first version of MyU. Um, now we launched it. We were very happy that we launched it. We started talking about it with uh, with you know faculty members. So I remember visiting. Um, the, uh, the College of Business, Business, Business Administration in Kuwait University. 
that I spoke about my you with the dean, uh, he liked the concept, and I thought that that was validation. I'm happy that he didn't see the app because he would have, uh, he would he would have you know uh, disapproved uh, the the proposal, but he approved it. They actually rec wrote a letter of recommendation. No one used it after that, uh, <laughs> but at least I got the validation that there was a communication gap, that the problem existed at least, right? Um, I met later on with uh, the dean of the College of uh, Computer Engineering. And that, that meeting was actually more hands-on. So that's when I actually showcased the app. Uh, I'm glad I did, because they were the first batch of very unhappy customers that gave me genuine feedback. You know how Bill Gates says your most unhappy customer is your greatest source of learning? Actually, it was this point, and uh, I was talking to Zainab about it. Uh, I don't remember the name of the faculty member, but she gave me the best feedback, which uh, we built MyU according to. We actually took her feedback, and we, 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 we thought of it, we analyzed it, and that's how MyU was built. So they were like, okay, okay, cool, so we can post. Yeah, we can post. Um, so when I post, who sees? I was like, everyone. And everyone was like, no, we, we can't. We, we need privacy, right? We need privacy. So it's like, what do you mean you need privacy? So they say, the, the, you know, there, some messages need to go to only the class that I'm teaching. And some messages need to go only to the student, to one student of mine, right? Some messages may go to the entire college, right? But what, you, what you're providing doesn't, doesn't provide that. We need, we need additional layers. We need more privacy. We need more controllability, right? So that was the first batch of negative feedback, and we've, we've built my U later on based on it. And, you know, uh, we kept the cycle going. So we go out to the market. We listen to people who actually used my U, uh, and most cases got disappointed. They teach us what, uh, what we need to do. We go back to the kitchen. We you know, build it again uh, with some tweaks. Uh, and then we go to the market. We develop this you know, cycle, the lean cycle. And I think this is what helped us gain the growth uh, momentum that we have uh, today. So this is a great opening for my next question. How do you um, uh, handle user feedback and prioritize additional features? Because what may be important to one user may not necessarily be important to another. Absolutely. So uh, in the beginning, it was uh, more of a manual process. Uh, but then we actually realized that the greatest, the biggest engine for growth is actually listening to users' feedback. If there is one element, one factor, that helped us grow from 500 users a day to 80,000 users a day, it's actually the word of mouth. And you only maximize the word of mouth through providing something that people, people like and people talk about. right? And you can only do that by listening to their feedback and, and developing you know, your, your, your product according to it. Um, your customers are your greatest resource, right? Because in the beginning, they tell you exactly what they need. Maybe sometimes they can't communicate it because they can't imagine it. But at least you, know, you can fetch it out from their body language, from their disappointments, and reach to exactly what uh, you know, the, to make the product the thing that, you know, they can, they can end up using. And then when you do that, they pay you for it, right? So they're, they're your company's greatest asset. So in the beginning, it was a very uh, manual process. Off lately, we've uh, improved the cycle uh, and the process of getting customer feedback. So at the end of every semester, we send out a survey for every uh, user of MyU. Um, and we ask three questions. And, uh, and I think it, it's very helpful for other startups also to probably do the same practice. We also took that from, from another company who was, that, that was um, you know, excelling at the time. So the first question is, what makes you, what makes you like MyU? Like what, what is the thing that you like about MyU? And then make sure that they're open-ended. So don't don't add uh, options, multiple choice uh, options, or anything like that. Let them speak out what they think. The first thing that comes to their mind, let them just say it. Let them write it down. 
So that's the first question. The second question, what do you hate about my you the most? And the third question is, what would you like to see in my you or in your product, in your company in the future? The first question actually gives you um, an idea of how your customers or users view you. How do they feel about you? How do they define you, right? How is this helpful? It's helpful when you want to run your next marketing campaign, targeting similar audiences, trying to widen your, 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 your circle of, of audience, right, of users. Because you want to use exactly the same words that your existing users used. Because those are the words that trigger the most. Because you're not your user. You, as a founder, or as, as someone who works in a small company, you are not the user. You're so into your business that you forget what the end user feels when they use your service. Right? So using exactly their words helps so much. So that is why we have the first question. The second question, what, what, you know, what they hate about the service, um, defines the things that you need to change within the existing uh, offerings. Right? You have certain functions, you have certain uh, flows, experiences. What is bothering them within those? And how can you maximize um, you know, the value and the experience and, and remove the friction points within that flow? The third is what they want to see in the future. And that defines your uh, future um, product development. So what kind of features do you want to develop? Right? Now the third question, to go back to your question, um, or actually rather with all of them, we, um, so we send it out massively to all the users and we get hundreds, sometimes thousands of responses. Now how do we define what response uh, or, or what answer should we give more priority to? We actually go through these questions one by one and they're, they're, they're typed down, right? So we analyze them. Some of them might have two, um, you know, two uh, elements, some of them might have more than that, some of them might have one element. But whenever an element is mentioned, then that element is listed, and then it gets one point. And then if it's repeated, then it gets a second point. So for example, if uh, 50 users suggest that we add uh, a grading feature within my U, then the grading feature would have 50 points, right? And then if 30 suggests that we have uh, uh, an attendance feature, then that would have you know, thir 30 grades. Now we have a, a systematic way of analyzing how to prioritize a, a certain feature over the other. Because this one was triggered more than the other one. Doesn't, doesn't say that the other one isn't important. It just says that this has to have more priority. So this is the process that we follow at the moment. That's really cool. Um, what about your developers? Like, did you have, fr from the beginning, did you have in-house developers? Did you outsource development? What did you, uh, how did you approach it? Right, so in the beginning, we, uh, we worked with outsourcing companies uh, when I was at KOC. So I was actually putting half to two thirds of my salary to pay these two companies. One company was doing our uh, iOS development and the other company was doing the Android in the back end um, and you know I thought that they were doing a good job because whenever they sent me their, their deliverables they worked perfectly well on my hand right uh, on my phone and for me and if there is any issue then I send it back to them and they fix it and they they, they you know they send me back the deliverable um, so that worked from 2014 to 2016. And at that stage, you know, the first year we probably, you know, we barely had any traffic. The second year is when we started growing in traffic. So we went from 500 a day to probably 2,000 a day to 5,000 a day. And then all of a sudden, the app was constantly breaking down. You see all sorts of issues with it. The more people come, the more problems uh, you know, occur in the app. We reached a point where we didn't want any more traffic, right? Uh, so, which is a very destructive uh, thought. 
Um, so that's when we decided to actually probably change the approach a little bit. And that was the point where we uh, have uh, you know, hired our own resources. And uh, you know, this is a very important uh, lesson. I mean, you could, I mean, it depends, it depends on the type of business that you're developing. But if you are uh, a technology dependent, and it depends on the level of the dependency, if you're a technology dependent uh, company, and your, you know, your, 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 your processes depend on the technology to work properly, then it becomes of a, of a critical importance to have your own uh, resources. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, an outsourcing company, a service company, is a contractor, right? The way they maximize their profit is through providing you with a satisfactory deliverable at the lowest cost. You agree? Yeah. yeah? But someone who works for the company, the way they ma maximize their career, their, uh, the satisfaction of their boss, right? Um, you know, uh, the way they minimize uh, problems that could occur uh, in the future that would require them to do extra work is to perfect their work and to build it, to build it in, a, in a very scalable way, to build it so that it would take millions of users, right? So scalability is uh, an aspect that normally is, you know, is missed in, in the first approach. So that's when we decided to actually shift, uh, shift hands. We flew to these two companies. They handed over the code to us. Uh, you know, our engineers looked at it, and they decided that this is something that we can't work with. So we scrapped it all. We built something from scratch. So from, yeah, so the two years effort, uh, I mean, the two years code uh, went to the trash can, but then we We've developed our own. The users stayed, um, but we've developed uh, you know, everything from scratch uh, exactly in 2016. So your developers are based in India? Yes. Yeah. So we have a, a company that we own that is doing our development. Uh, so it's, they're our, our own staff. Uh, they're based in India. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, 13 uh, resources, 13 engineers. Uh, on different departments, and they're taking care of the end-to-end -end requirements when it comes to development. Okay, and how big is your team? Uh, also, how, what are the systems and processes you have in place to ensure smooth operations across borders? So at, uh, at the moment, we are 16, 17 individuals working on MyU. Um, 13 in the management, in the in the in the technical team, and for in the uh, on the management. So we're still a very technically oriented company, um, which is something that um, that we need to probably work a little bit more on, in, in developing our business side, our our management side. Um, and it's uh, you know, especially with working with with a company that's that's not. Um, you know, that, that is handling your, your technical aspects from a different, uh, different office, um, you need to establish good communication processes with them. Um, and this comes with time, right? It's not, it's not a one-time shot. But we've developed uh, a way for us to, uh, you know, basically analyze. So we do all the analysis from the user's side. We categorize, uh, like I said, uh, the, the different features, we, and then prioritize them. And then we go through the design process. We discuss, we have a, uh, you know, a you know, conf conference call with, with the team. We discuss all aspects of any feature that we want to develop. Uh, and then they give us the estimate uh, in terms of you know, time and deliverables. And then we take it from there. But I mean, it's a, it's a continuous communication cycle. Uh, we try to keep weekly uh, calls with the team. And that's how we, you know, we manage all aspects of, of the development from, from Kuwait. Mm -hmm. So how, uh, you mentioned earlier that, uh, like for, in, for example, with the developers, that they would work better if they were working for the company rather than if they were, outsour if they were being outsourced. So how does MyU incentivize its employees to deliver their best? So there are two types of people who could work with you. Um, there are employees. I mean, eventually, on paper, everyone is an employee, right? But there are employees with an attitude of an employee, right? 
and there are employees with an attitude of a founder. Yeah? What do you think is the difference between the two? Ah, you, need, you, need, you, you, need, you need as many founders as you want, especially in every department. But what do you think is the key differentiation between the two? Exactly. The founder thinks it's their own company. So they, they, they give their best. But why do they do that? They have that initiative. Okay. They don't need more incentives. I mean, the right. other employees, they are only employees, so they need incentives to work. Uh huh. And okay, and the incentive comes in the, the, in the form of. Right. They are more loyal. Yes, I mean, these are amazing people. What, but what, what makes them do that, though? Why, why do they do that? Hmm? Maybe they're inspired by the, by the leader of the organization. I, I believe that's a very, very important aspect. Please. Sorry? Goal and moral alignments. So maybe if they, if they believe in the vision of the company, they want this to happen. Whatever you, you have in your mind and you, you communicate to your people, they believe it. They believe in it so much that they want to see this in the world, right? right. They, they want this to happen. This is, this is kind of the criteria. If you have people who think they are founders, uh -huh. and then they believe in both the moral value and the goal value of the company, mm -hmm. they will be created for the larger whole. And then whether the company fails or succeeds, they will work regardless. And this is something that is more valuable than just hiring someone. Perfect. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Please. Uh, um, he don't uh, look for salary. Uh, he look for forward to the success. I think this is the point. Actually, I'm, I'm coming to this. It's a very important point. Actually, on the contrary to what you were saying, not everybody is very interested in the company come across people that they're very experienced and they want to, well, when you say is what is the initiative for the person to actually work for the entire company, sometimes it's not that, oh, the company is going to go up and down. It's actually all about experience. Mm. If, if they, let's just say, as you said, moral alignment, it's based on their self rather than based on the company. Mm. So say that, okay, let's take this as a test for myself. I will imagine that this is my company and I'm going to work to the best. Now, as he mentioned, that sometimes you don't search for money. Mm. And on the contrary, what if it's actually a part of that? Like, everything positive has a negative in it and everything has a contrast. So I'm, I'm not trying to say it's mm. like a negative, negative thing, but in my point of view, uh, that is possible. Okay. They could actually take that as a, like a test for themselves because not everybody is like, oh, let's do this for the company because the company is amazing. Or, right. Yeah, so. Okay. So would you rather have employees or would you rather have founders? How many, how many wants employees over founders? I think both. But if you're hiring someone. It depends and, on the position you're hiring them for. Depends on the position. Right. Do, do you, do you, would you run in, in any case where you want an employee and not want a founder? The one who's going to execute the work, like a routine work, or they, you just, it's like a train, right. them on track and they just go. Okay. Um, where <coughs> maybe in positions where you need creativity mm -hmm. and you need a founder. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in our case, we always prefer founders. We always prefer founders. We don't look for employees. I mean, we're forced to hire employees, right? It's not like uh, you know everyone from the 17 people we have are founders. No, but we try to set the 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 motives, right? So that even if someone is coming with an employee attitude, how can we actually shift their mindset to actually embrace this company as if it's their own? And sometimes it's very difficult to achieve, right? But what, I've, um, what we have done so far, and that worked um, very well, and I say that with uh, a few of our uh, 
you know, colleagues at a sister company. They're here, they're, so you should probably know uh, what, what, what is being cooked. Uh, so we normally don't pay, for someone who we, who we believe is going to be a founder, we don't pay the market price. We don't pay the market price. We, different, we communicate something different. We communicate the vision of the company. We communicate the growth potential, right? We communicate um, the, the, the amazing scale that this company can have if we work hard, right? Now, for a founder, this definitely triggers something within them, right? Someone is willing to compromise on the salary for some time. Money is important. Money, you know, is... is how you pay your expenses and how you pay your family's expenses. But coming with a mindset of let me compromise a little bit because I want to see this bigger in the future and I want to be part of this shift. This is where we identify the founders, right? Now, it's all about creating a stake for the founder. It's all about you know, developing an understanding within the founder that this is a project of their own. Um, and oftentimes we use uh, actually uh, uh, ESOPs, uh, equity, uh, equity stakes um, that we give to, to, to the employees as a, as a way to incentivize them. And sometimes uh, we actually, you know, when it's the appraisal due time, we give two offers. And this is something that I do all, all the time. You give a higher salary offer with a lower equity grant and a lower salary offer with a higher equity grant, right? And then two offers are valid, and there is no judgment, right? He could, you know, the employee could take any, any of the two. The employee who is oriented long-term and who believes so much in the company, would he rather take the higher salary at a lower equity grant? A lower salary. They, would, they would take a lower salary. Now, of course, it has to be reasonably low for them to still survive and pay their expenses, right? That has, that has to be secured. That has to be secured. Um, but if they're future-oriented, then that additional equity grant, could, grant could, could actually amount to maybe 100 times the, the additional salary, the salary that they would rather get right now. So playing around with these concepts, at the time you, you send an offer out to someone, at the time you interview them, and throughout their experience with you as a company, developing that sense of ownership and make them part of the story, like making them actually part of the story, sharing the numbers with them, connecting them with the, with the company KPIs and celebrating those KPIs with them and, uh, you know, uh, associating that achievement with the, with the employee, right? That creates a founder. Oftentimes, someone comes with the mindset that they will work, and this happens all the time. It happens at my U as well. Um, and I'm happy to share this. Um, when I first went, that was three years ago, uh, to, to, to meet the first batch of, of employees who worked with us, I think we were, we were at seven employees uh, back in, in 2016 uh, in India. So I met with them and we had this kind of you know, casual discussion. It's kind of like a discussion outside of the sphere of work. Uh, so forget about me being uh, you know, the manager and you being the employee, you know, let's just, let's just chit chat. What motivates you? What do you like to do? How do you see yourself in two years? And, you know, we, we, we give them the, the freedom to share their thoughts, right? And a lot of them actually say that, you know, in, in, in a year or two, I, uh, I, I would be looking for a, a different kind of uh, career. I would want to work at a different uh, company in a different sector in different such and such, right? So the, the mindset that they're coming with is that they will leave the company in two years. And I'm happy that you know, our retention so far has been amazing. Those people are now what we've been able to create founders out of. They embrace their projects. They're still with us three years down the road. Um, and you know, they feel sense, a sense of ownership for their own department like, uh, like never before. And it's, it's only through instilling that these doses of of you know, inspiration and of, of ownership sense uh, into these uh, people throughout the, throughout the experience, their experience with you and throughout the engagement. So this is what we try to achieve. 
Well, I hope I answered your question. Who wants to work at MyU? <laughs> Okay, I want to dive. <laughs> I want to dive more into the business side of things. Uh, so, tell us what are the milestones a startup should aim to achieve, and in what kind of timeline? So, normally every startup starts with identifying a problem, right? And everyone agrees to this. Yes, you define a problem. You you identify a problem and you decide that you want to solve this problem. So the first milestone is what we call, what they call a problem solution fit, right? Validi validating that um, the, pro the solution that you propose to this problem would actually work. And this normally comes at a conceptual level, sometimes in the prototype stage or even before that, through sitting with, with customers talking to them, uh, you validate to the extent that you can that such a uh, solution would be able to solve the problem that the, the client is facing. So this would be the first milestone. The second milestone uh, comes after you've developed your product, after you've launched it in the market, after you've done quite some uh, number of iterations and going back and forth between you know, the users or the customers and developing the features and developing that cycle. And it's called the product market fit. It's when you validate that what, what you built actually fits the market, the real market, the actual market, right? This is when you will start having customers. This is when people will probably start paying you, right? Uh, and then the third milestone which I think, especially in our region here, given the, the circumstances of the ecosystem and the investment, um, you know, the investment um, attitude that we have in, in Kuwait or even in, in the GCC, is achieving cash flow positivity. I think that's very, very critical. You know, if we were in, a, in an ecosystem where investment is very readily available, uh, I would say, I mean, this can happen sometime in the future. Don't, don't, don't make it the priority. I mean, we see these IPOs up until today, companies with, uh, you know, 10 or, or 15 years, um, and they, they're not yet cash flow positive, and they IPO, and they receive investment. And, you know, whenever they want, they can receive all the investment they want, right? Because the ecosystem is actually uh, very tolerant to this kind of, of businesses. Here, if you don't achieve cash flow positivity, then you're at a great risk of um, not making it, you know, of, of, of shutting down, right? Uh, and then, especially if you're, you know, if you're seeking investment, that can become a pressure point that the investors can set on the startup when, whenever you're, 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 you're negotiating or, dis or discussing. When they know that you're not cash flow positive, then you're under the pressure of receiving investment at whatever valuation the, the investor wants. So if, if there's one advice that I would give to startups is, you know, try and achieve cash flow positive, secure your position, secure your uh, survival, right? Because oftentimes, there's no problem with the company. The concept is great, the market is there, it just needs more time. It just needs more patience. It needs more patience, right? Um, maybe the customers aren't ready yet. Maybe uh, you, 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 know, you haven't built enough awareness about it. Awareness takes time. And you know, again, all the marketing that you do is a function of how much money you have. And in the beginning, you don't have so much money to create all the awareness, right? So you're working with those, within those variables, right? Um, but you might, you might be cash flow negative, not because the company isn't going to work. It's only because you need more time, right? So having that as a, as a target helps, and I think it's, is, is going to you know, help many companies make it through and survive. And then after that, then you can have an upper hand when it comes to looking for investment money, and you can take this money absolutely to grow, but not to secure your survival. So, so in that case, what are the potential sacrifices or trade-offs that a business may have to make 
to maintain or achieve cash flow positivity? Well, in the short run, you, you compromise not going as fast, right? If you have investment, then you can spend that investment money in, in growth, right? Growth is a function of some other type of input. That input is called land labor capital, right? You need labor, you need capital, and you need, uh, you, you, you need a place for them to work, right? So those inputs generate your growth. Now, if you don't have so much on the left side, you won't have so much on the right side, right? So these compromises, you know, these things come at a compromise on the growth potential of the company. Uh, but on the, on the flip side, you, you secure your survival as a company. And then you're always open for investment. So whenever you have the investment ready, and even the attitude after receiving the investment, my advice is to always look to secure the survival of your company. So achieve cash flow positivity first, and then look for growth. I wouldn't advise as such if we had uh, 400 VCs in Kuwait investing and, uh, and you know, competing on opportunities. Unfortunately, the case is not that. You know, in, in, in the full year of 2017 or 18, I forgot, we had four, four deals from the local. So it's not, there isn't really an ecosystem locally. Um, so you need to play around with the variables that you have. So what business metrics should uh, tech startups focus on? Well, in general, you want to focus on the key metric that matters, right? The, what we call the top-level KPI of your company. Um, that that top-level KPI is what will create your company's revenue or the potential of it making revenue in the future. So, for example, if you are a, um, a delivery company, what, would you, what do you think the top-level KPI of a delivery company would be? Huh? Mm, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would argue that this is a driver. So you have top-level KPIs, and then you have drivers. The drivers is everything that increases, that could potentially affect the top-level KPI. But the top-level KPI is your absolute target, right? Uh, customer served. Number of customers served, I would argue that this is a driver. Okay. Number of orders. The number of orders you have per day, right? Now, in order for you to increase the number of orders per day, you want to increase your customer's uh, you know, base, right? So if you have 50 customers and you're at 50 order, orders a day, so the customer average order uh, amount per day is one, right? So you know that if you take the, 100, the 50 customers and make them 500 customers, then this will be 500 order, orders a day and then you will need a bigger fleet, right? And then with the bigger fleet, you need better management, so you need to invest in those systems. And then you need marketing and you need all that. But there's always one top level KPI that has to be communicated across all the departments. And every department in the company has to have its own KPI that acts as a driver to the top level KPI of the company as a whole. Let me share with you an example of um, of a company that has a less of a straightforward uh, top-level KPI. What, what do you think is a top-level KPI of Facebook? Customer interaction. Yes. Yes. They just define it in a different way. Eyeballs. Engagement, so, so interactivity. Yeah. How do they define it, though? It's, it's, it's the right answer. Huh? Active users. So how do, you, how, do we, how do they normally define active users? What intervals do they take? Huh? Uh, that would be a driver. User traffic? Yes. Yeah, active users. So, so user traffic. So the way they, they actually uh, define active users, and you will see that across in the, in the reports, uh, um, you know, in, on the news and all of that. Uh, and it's the metric that, will, that Facebook will always communicate to say that we're growing as a company. There's the revenue, of course, but their top-level KPI is not the revenue. It's active users, daily active users, divided by monthly active users. 
Hmm? Div daily active users divided by monthly active users, which means average monthly active users. So uh, it all goes back to what you all rightly said. It's the engagement. It's the interactivity, right? Do you think if the daily active to monthly active is 50%, is that better or uh, worse than 25%? Huh. Do we have engineers here? <laughs> Too much <Any>? math. <laughs> no engineers. OK. Yalla. If the daily active to monthly active is 50%, is that better or worse than, than 25%? It's much better, of course. It's double. It means out of my monthly active users, half of them are actually checking the app every day. Yes? This is the engagement metric. Right? Now, why, why did they take this as their top-level KPI? Exactly. So a social network. How do, the, how do they make money? How does social, a social network make money? Through ads, right? So what do they sell? Huh? They sell? They sell impressions, right? They sell impressions. So if you give Facebook two impressions a day, and I give Facebook three impressions a day, who do you think is more valuable to Facebook? Me, right? Because I've, I've allowed them to monetize out of three impressions and you only gave them two impressions. They sell our impressions to people. Unlike different kinds of products, in social networks, the user is not the customer. The user is actually the product. They're actually selling our impressions to advertisers. So they want to maximize the impression amount. And they maximize that through maximizing the engagement level. And the engagement level is how many, how many times do I check Facebook per day? Do I check it every day? Do I check it every other day? Do I check it once a week? Do I check it once a month? So today, the monthly active users on Facebook is beyond uh, 2 billion uh, people, right? The daily active is probably half of that, or maybe 55%. It's mind-blowing. But if they get that, 55% theoretically to, let's say, 75%. Then the revenue potential is actually increased by almost 50%. Is that too technical? Or, yeah? Yeah, so out of, they, 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 they increased their revenue by 50% because increasing from 50% to 75% is is 50% of, yeah? yeah? So I think we're going off track. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I mean you, you need to define your company's top-level KPI. I see many companies actually failing because they don't have that quite clear. If you don't have a clear grasp of your top-level KPI, then you might do many activities that would cost you money at no benefit. If you have that clear, then every single activity the company does has to reflect positively on the top-level KPI. If you do something that reflects negatively on the top-level KPI, then you're probably heading in the wrong direction. Right? This is your gauge as a company. So who, who wants to share with us, for example, what, what company you work, you work for, what, what, especially the small businesses, what, in, what, in what industry? Huh? Please. Accessories. Car accessories? No, phone. Phone accessories, okay. And? Yeah, so, so your, your company sells phone accessories, right? So yours is probably more straightforward. So you, you want to maximize the number of transactions every day, yeah? So this would be the top level KPI. Now, in order for him to do that, he probably needs a storage space. He needs to do some marketing. He needs to do some events here and there. He needs to connect with suppliers. He needs to connect with clients. 
all of that has to contribute to the number of transactions they have per day. And that is their metric, or the one metric that matters to them. And similarly, every company should define that. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, like, for example, a lot of uh, companies may focus on, just in the realm of social media, like they would focus on growing or focusing mm. on likes or followers yeah. when instead those are just vanity metrics. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, since we are running out of time, and I do want to open the floor to questions, so I'm going to ask you one last question before we open for Q&A. What skills do you believe an entrepreneur should possess or develop to run a business successfully? Well, I think eventually a founder has to, has to, has to build a team, right? You know, in the beginning, if you're running a company on your own, then you are the team, right? You're doing everything on your own, right? But eventually, as the company progresses, and you, you grow as a company, then um, you, know, you start hiring. As the company starts specializing, the functions within the company start specializing. So all of a sudden, you need to do more marketing. All of a sudden, you need to do more operations. You need to do uh, more customer service. You need some data management. You need some development, right? So you start, you start branching out as a company, right? And you need more people to fill out those gaps, right? Um, so the key uh, attribute in a good founder is be able to build a team that could work together in being better than the founder themselves in running every aspect of the company, right? So leadership skills uh, and being able to motivate the team, bringing, bringing them together, right? Uh, not fearing uh, of, of uh, you, know, have, you know, having to hire someone who is better than you, uh, rather being able to communicate and being able to motivate. Uh, so, and w while focusing on the key metric that matters and making everyone work towards it. I think that is the key attribute for growing as a company. Because eventually you will, uh, you will have nothing to do with your own hands, right? You will be hands off as you grow as a company, and everything will be handed over to someone else. Now you need to establish uh, your team to the level uh, and give them the confidence and give them the freedom so that they can um, you know, um, do their job, excel in it, treat it as if it's their own, and, and, and still be connected with the bigger uh, you know, circle of you know, the company and the vision. So I think it's, it's really the, the human skills and being able to build that team and lead them uh, and you know, make sure that you're heading in the right direction. And like we said, connect everyone with their, with, with their respective KPIs and how those connect to the top level KPI of the company. Awesome. So questions. <clears throat> um, yeah. About the point that you were just talking about, so we won't be, you know, like trying to remember before. Mm. Um, you said one of the most important skills is human skills, mm. but um, you also mentioned at the beginning is to be very persistent mm. and not give up easily. Mm. Yeah. So, do you agree that also um, persistence, uh, passion is also very important Absolutely. for entrepreneurs? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. For, for, for obvious reasons, entrepreneurship is not an easy path, right? In fact, it's very difficult. And it's, it's most difficult when the ecosystem is lacking, right? Because you're doing the groundwork. Uh, you know, speaking of the ecosystem, when, when do you have an ecosystem? You have an ecosystem when there are examples. Mm -hmm. When, you know, you have companies like Talabat and Karaj and, and Boutiquat and you know, people who made it, right? That's when you have an ecosystem, because all of a sudden, you have entrepreneurs who see these companies and want to be like them. And you have investors who see these opportunities, and they want to invest in them. Now, these people, when they started, they didn't have that ecosystem. They actually built it from ground up. They had to do the groundwork. And for you to be able to do that, if you're not passionate enough, 
and patient enough, then you just won't, won't you, you will lose interest with time, right? You won't make it. Especially if you're, if you're just doing it for the sake of, uh, you know, money, right? If you're, only, if you're only looking at money as the metric, but you're not really in love with the problem you're solving or, or the solution that you, that you are uh, building, then chances are that you will give up much faster than someone who actually is. Because you could be in the struggle of you know, knocking on doors, trying to find a client, or uh, you might be at a point where you, know, you just received a rejection letter from an investor, or maybe your, your customers don't like your product, or maybe you received a bad rating, and you hear about your friend who just brought a, a burger franchise and is making uh, 10,000 KD a month, right? And if you're all about money, then you'd rather be like him, right? It's much easier. I mean, everyone understands a burger. You don't need to explain to someone what a burger is. Uh, you can sell them very fast. Uh, everyone likes them, right? So, but passion about your concept and passion about business is really what makes you go through uh, these with, you know, with, with better persistence. So absolutely, absolutely agree. Salam. أنا عندي سؤال كان في إن شلون نسأل الكاستمرز حق الآب نسألهم ثلاث أسئلة إذا كان الفكرة الأيدية مو آب مثلا هما مو مشكلة يعني هو شلون إحنا نقدر نوصل حق الناس يعني اللي راح يستخدمون ال يعني المنتج هذا للحين ما بنيت اي المنتج ها؟ اي للحين ما وصل مرحلة البروتوتايب حلو فمثلا شلون احنا نسال الناس اذا هم لهم قابلية ممتاز اللي راح يستخدمونه انت الحين اذا تذكرين تكلمنا عن البروبلم سولوشن فيت انت شفتي مشكلة؟ شفتي ايه. مشكلة بس للحين ما سويتي ولا شيء بس هو سويت نفس انه حل كحل نظري وقاعد اشوف ايه. البروتوتايب ممتاز اي انت قاعد قاعد تحاولين توصلين حق النقطة الأولى اللي تكلمنا عليها اللي هي البروبلم سولوشن فيت that she's, she's trying to validate that her solution could work for this problem. Maybe it's a solution, uh, maybe, maybe let's say, uh, she's trying to sell, uh, I don't know, automotive spare parts. <laughs> maybe not. I am not good at There's someone who is, right? Hot dogs. Excuse me. Hot dogs is not a startup, come on, it's already. Uh, but maybe, maybe she wants to build a website to give, for example, consultations, uh, mm -hmm. life coaching consultations, right? For example, because I don't want to ask you personally. Uh, so at this stage, if she has, if she has this concept, the, the right thing to do is to start interviewing people in the same field. So she, if she's connecting, for example, consultants, life, coach, life coaches with people who need life coaching, right? So she needs to meet with life coaches and she needs to meet with you know, individuals who could potentially apply for, uh, for life coaching. And she needs to validate that these guys are willing to spend time online giving people these life coaching sessions and that the customer is willing to spend money to go online and connect with a life coach. That's it. If she can validate that with you know, uh, not just one customer, maybe 20 customers, 30 customers, depends on the pool of customers that you have access to, then you've achieved the product solution fit, uh, sorry, problem solution fit. Mm -hmm. So you're still in that phase. Now once you've achieved the problem solution fit, that's when you start, start building your product and build the smallest possible product. Launch it out there. The target, the goal of the first product is to receive negative feedback. It's not to, keep, to make your customers happy. So you don't want to market your first product. That's a very important thing, especially with people who are getting uh, investment from the Kuwait National Fund. I see you know, everyone spending so much on marketing from day one. Because products that you've never heard about, all of a sudden are on, on billboards, and on the backs of buses and, and all that jazz, right? If, 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 
if they're lucky and you know they, they hit the jackpot and their product is exactly what the market wants, uh, chances are it's not yet because it's their first release, then perfect. But chances are by doing that, and they're not yet, they don't have yet a product market fit, is they're only accelerating their failure as a company. Because they're giving a product that doesn't solve the problem a big exposure. And they're only sending a message to the market that this product doesn't, doesn't work. Come see my product, it doesn't work. Right? What do you think? Do you think, do you think that's a, right? And you will lose the cash flow. You, you, lose, you lose your cash flow, you lose your company image, you lose everything, right? But once you've validated that your product actually works, you have re recurring customers that come back, there's payments, you, you're probably in the range of, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 KD a month, that's when you want to spend massively, right? And you've developed your funnels. You know, you know every company is, acts like a funnel, especially online companies. So you have clients uh, on the top of the funnel who only have, uh, are in the awareness zone, right? They're in the awareness zone, and then some might take an action, so they might visit your website. Then a, a smaller fraction might register, a smaller might uh, decide to, uh, to purchase, and then maybe some of them will, will refer your product to someone else because they like it, right? So if your funnel uh, conversion is, let's say, 1%, so out of 100 people who are exposed to your company, 1% makes a purchase, then you know that by exposing your company to uh, 1,000, you're, you're actually 10xing your, your revenue, your transactions. Right? Makes sense? Another way to actually uh, 10x your revenue is not to spend so much on marketing, which is the most preferred way, and fix the funnel throughout. So rather than making your conversion 1%, make it 10%. Explore the friction points at every step of the funnel and try to eliminate them. If people drop from, uh, from visiting the website to registration, start asking yourself, what in the registration step am I lacking? Why is there so much drop at the registration uh, step? And maybe you can work on that. And if it's a 50% drop, maybe you can reduce that to 25% drop. Right? And then if after registration they don't buy a product, then maybe work on the experience, maybe on the product offerings. And if you, if you are successful in just improving your conversions from 1% at the end of the funnel to 2%, then that's double your revenue without spending any extra on marketing. But once you've achieved that, and once you've validated that the cost of acquiring a customer is higher than the life, that is less than the time life value of, of achieving them, then that's when you go massively and start marketing. So keep it up, Yanni. In table phase the first phase. The first phase is the first phase. If you don't get out of it, you can do something small, put it on the customers, and see what they're going to do, and then we'll take them from there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, hi. Uh, so I had uh, three questions again. Um, uh, the first one is that uh, when you are starting up, okay, mm -hmm. uh, starting the app, how, uh, how did you select the companies and uh, what were the cheaper ways to get a developer? Okay. How did I? Yeah, the two companies that you selected for developing your app. Uh -huh. Okay. And why well, I would, did you? I, w I wouldn't recommend you go that path. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. So, how do you trust a developer if uh, if it's uh, a free lancer? Okay, this is the first question. Okay. Uh, the second question is that uh, how do you motivate your staff that is uh, working abroad mm. uh, to stay on the same vision? Mm. The third question is that um, okay, uh, rather the employee be abroad or in Kuwait. Mm. Okay. Uh, employee that was looking like a founder mm -hmm. leaves you within two years. And how do you deal with it then? 
Uh, well, I'll go, I'll go to the first question. How did I select them? I, I don't think, I was desperate. Like, I, I, did, I wanted to build the app. I was willing to invest my salary to build it, right? But I didn't know how to build it. I looked for, you know, I, it, they weren't the first companies that I started with. So I, uh, I took a few slaps here and there, especially with the local companies. I didn't like any of them, wasted so much money on them. Um, and then I decided to go to actually deal with, with the two companies that I, that I dealt with. In the beginning, it was just one company, and then uh, you know one department was lacking, so I decided to take it to a different company. So it was, there was no, it's not clear. It's not like a straightforward process. Your second question, how do I keep them motivated? I think it all goes back to your, your leadership skills, right? Um, if they, everyone wants to grow, right? That's a human nature. Everyone wants to grow. No one wants to stay still. Everyone values uh, progress uh, in their career and in, in their experience, right? So if, you, if you're able to provide that kind of environment, uh, an environment that rewards hard work and rewards um, contribution and, and, and innovation, then they'll stick with you. Because chances are not many companies are doing that, right? But you, you, should, be, you should be very uh, focused on that. Because once you start, you know, losing that uh, that kind of uh, fairness, right, and 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 freedom and and openness to to grow within the organization, then that's when they will start looking elsewhere. And your third question is how do I how would I deal with someone who leaves the company? I mean, I mean, it's at the end of the day, there, you know, there's a contract between you and them, right? They can leave whenever they want. They can, they, if they leave, then they, they've probably found a better opportunity elsewhere. That creates a pressure on you to probably enhance what the offerings that you have, the package that you have, and the work environment that you have to make sure that no other employee wants to leave. So if someone leaves, then we need to ask, ask why, why he left. At, po at some, you know, sometimes, and it probably will happen a lot in the case of startups who don't have enough money to invest uh, in, in paying salaries is because the, the employee just found uh, a better offer, someone that could pay them more, right? In which case, you should definitely play uh, on the uh, ESOP uh, part, so uh, equity grants, providing equity grants with, uh, with a vesting period and see if they value that maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe try and connect them with the vision. But I mean, I mean, it's it's a it's a common challenge that every company has to face. Mm, yes, thank you. Yeah, well. no. Did you face any uh, competitor who trying to do the same idea on the same application? Sorry? And if yes, uh, how did you deal with that? Well, in the beginning, we didn't know of any competition. We were doing it because we liked the concept and we thought that no one else was doing it. Uh, now we know of international com competitors that are amazing companies with tens of millions of dollars of funding and you know, they're, they're just they're, they're doing great. They're just doing great in a different part of the world, maybe in the States, in Europe. And we, uh, our competitive advantage is to be able to talk to the local uh, local audience better than, than they can. So your audience is in Kuwait or in Middle East? We're, we're mostly in, in Kuwait, Saudi, so we're in the GCC, but most of our users are in Kuwait, Saudi. Okay, mm -hmm. and if, if one, uh, one day someone told you that I want to buy this application, are you going to follow your passion or are you going to sell it in a huge amount of money? It depends how much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, eventually, if you if you're running a, if you if you set up a company, a startup, then you have to have an exit strategy. And an exit strategy is one of two things for a startup: you either sell it, or you IPO. IPO, I don't think is an option, at least in our region here. So you, you definitely want to opt in for for selling it. You just want to grow it as much as you can, for the cash to be satisfying when you sell it. Thank you. <clears throat> we have a question here. 
Sorry, further to what you said earlier, do you feel that turnover is healthy, though, even though hmm? people, employees tend to leave at every organization? But do you feel that it's healthy? Uh, I feel it's normal. Yeah. It definitely is a... Because you get in new ideas when new employees come in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, hiring is healthy. Losing a good resource isn't. Yeah. I, I would make a distinction. But, I mean, every organization, no matter how good it is, you know, employees will leave. Sometimes they leave because they don't like the organization. Sometimes they leave because they just want to pursue a different passion. Maybe they have a different... They want to explore something else. Maybe they want to grow in a different uh, line of career. I mean, even Google loses, loses staff, right? So the key is for you to... Uh, to keep the engine of recruiting working. You have to always be on a recruiting mode. So we have one individual who is a dedicated HR manager in, in India, and all she does is headhunt. And she, uh, she sources uh, resources. Some of them are so seniors, some of them are juniors, and we're always in constant... Um, interviewing attitude and you know sometimes we hire sometimes we we keep them on record but you always you want to maximize your reachability as a company for whenever you need a resource to be able to source them as as easily as possible but it's very challenging we were discussing with AU the other day it is a very challenging thing unless you have AU because he's uh, he's a good uh, resource So the sound gets recorded. Oh, okay. I'm not okay um, now, during your journey from 2014, right? Yes. From 2014 to 2019, that is today, uh, let's regard those two years that, you know, the, the whole coding was, you know, it was a fail and you had to re research again and mm -hmm. re-come up with a new idea. So what was... The tipping point that you felt like none of this is going to work anymore, and how did you overcome it? The app was breaking. <laughs> it wasn't yeah, working. yeah, it was breaking. <laughs> but like, what was that thing that you know, just a little push, and you're like, I'm that halas, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm over. I don't need this anymore. But what right. is the thing that motivated you to keep going, and you know, bring you to who you are today? It's the fact that it was breaking because many people wanted my you. That kept me motivated. It wasn't breaking because of no reason, right? It was breaking because we're at 5,000 a day, and you know, more people want to use it, but we just didn't have the technology to handle that load. So that is a motivation. But yeah, at points, uh, probably early on, um, I was, you know, I had to make a decision whether to invest uh, an extra 5,000 KD or not, and I only had one user or two, right? That is a much harder decision to make. Because at that time, you, you know, you're not clear <laughs> if it's worth the investment. Will I lose to those two users and go back to zero? Or after the 5,000 KD investment, will the two users grow to 200, right? So this is a much harder uh, decision to make. Um, but at that stage, we knew that we had a product that a lot of people wanted to use. It just, we didn't have the technology. And once we worked on the technology, that's when things uh, started, you know, growing at a much faster pace for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cool. We have one more question. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, when do you start your day? How many hours you work a day? And the second is, where did the name MyU came from? I try to maintain nine to five. Oftentimes, I find myself actually working past five, sometimes in the midnight. Uh, 
I tend to start working from home. So when I, when I first wake up, I have to check my email, I have to finish whatever is pending on, on my side, especially that India is two hours and a half uh, uh, ahead, right? So by the time you wake up at, say, eight, they've already you know, went through two hours and a half of, of, of work. Um, so I tr try to finish that. I try to exercise a little bit before, before going to work, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to, to make it through the day uh, with my shoulder pain and hip pain, all from long hours of sitting down. Uh, and then I go to, to the office. Normally, I make it to the office by 9.30. Uh, I stay until, I try to cap it at five. Um, oftentimes it goes beyond that. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's better if you don't overwork. Like, uh, in, you know, if you, ask, if you ask me this question last year, uh, oftentimes I would be at the office at past uh, 8 p.m. Uh, but what I realized after that is you actually uh, burn out. You... So, so maintaining a nice balance between uh, putting your mindset into work and then doing something that is totally different, absolutely not related to work, and probably keeping your phone uh, at home or in the car and just absolutely disconnecting helps so much because you get back to it with a fresh mind and you can you know, have better clarity. Uh, and it's a good stress management. So maintaining a nice balance is good on the long run. Now, in certain, certain, certain cases, you might have a ta uh, task overload that you might want to invest more time on, uh, and that's when you, know, you, you want to you work uh, additional hours. Your second question? Well, My you. Uh, uh, initially, we were targeting universities. So that's where My you came from. Now we're targeting schools, um, but I mean, we kept the name. You normally refers to universities, but we see it oftentimes yeah. also. Sorry? It can, it, can see, it can be my you, right? Yes. Or, you know, we see it also oftentimes refers to education in general. And we like the name. We like how it sounds. So we just kept it. Right. I think his question was at the beginning when you started um, the business, right? How many hours? Uh, we, Well, in the beginning, you work more than yeah, more, more than eight hours a day. Well, regardless if regardless if you're actually sitting on the desk or not, it's your mindset, right? You you could you could actually be on the desk but not doing any uh, any work, any actual work, and you could be just you know walking around with the mindset and thinking uh, and planning things. Uh, and that is, is, is actually work. So I, I would make a distinction. So oftentimes we won't be at the desk from, for eight hours or 12 hours, but it's the mindset and you know, the access to work uh, and access to finish uh, certain tasks. Okay. Hi. Hello. So as you said that team planning is very important. So why and how did you choose like India for your development? Like after two years, like from 2014 to 2016, mm. you said your app was breaking. So after that, like, like you didn't mention like how did you like go to India, go to mm. or find someone in India to build your app. Mm. Like, and I don't, do you have a development team in Kuwait as well? No. So uh, it, all for, it all started when I met um, my CTO. Raviraj. Um, I met him online and I, I then traveled to Mumbai and I met him there. And uh, we had a few meetings and we agreed to take things forward. He helped me so much. Uh, it helps so much when you have someone who has a technical foundation because they know, they know what to do, right? They know what to do. It's not your job as the uh, business side of the company to decide what the technical side should be, right? Someone who comes from a technical background knows he, they should understand your requirements and they should decide the, the, how the department should look like, right? So immediately he said, we will have to start hiring the back-end team. 
forget about the iOS and Android now. Let's, let's just focus on backend because uh, it was breaking. The backend was breaking, right? So, so we, we, we hired uh, an amazing two uh, senior uh, developers. They're still there, my engineering managers today. Uh, and then we flew to those two companies um, and we, they looked at the code and they, you know, they didn't like it at all. It was old technology, old everything. Bad architecture, non-scalable. Um, so then, you know, they, they said, okay, we will start working, now that, that they handed us the code, we'll start working with basically just fixing, patching the existing code, just for it to sustain the traffic. And we're able to do that uh, and, and be able to handle up to 10,000 uh, users a day of traffic on the existing app. And it took us nine months to actually rebuild the whole thing. So to launch uh, the MyU as it is, um, not, not as it is today, but the version of MyU which was done from scratch. It took nine months. Uh, and yeah, that's how we took it. And then the team started growing from them. Hmm. One more question, like normally it's important in startups, hmm. like how, import, how important is a CTO to a non-technical founder? Absolutely Thanks, essential, right? of course. If it's a technical company, if it's a, if it's a tech startup, then you can't, th that's the first person you want to start with. And what's that, the best way to find them? Like, that's the hardest thing. <laughs> that's the hardest thing, finding the right people. I wouldn't say that there's a, a way to it. You want to explore every potential avenue to it. So job posts online, ask Sirdab, uh, attend events, uh, go to Coded, maybe you'll find some, I don't know, just explore every potential avenue. At the end, you need to find someone who A, is capable, B, is interested, C, that you can work with. I guess that's again the problem solution that you talked about at the beginning. You mm -hmm. have a problem with the other two companies for two years. Mm -hmm. So by, after two years, by that time, you don't have your experience, you know, what you will have to look for to solve mm -hmm. your problem. Right. So that helps you to choose the right Absolutely. Person. Yeah, and you have, you, have the, you have the most clarity when you have nothing, right? That's why I don't urge startups early on to, to look for a, a big amount of investment. Because you want to open the avenues. You want to be an in an explorative mode, right? And you want to have the, mass, the, the most clarity of how the market looks like, what the customer is, is, is like, what service am I offering, how do they perceive my service, what do they think about my, my company. And you can't have that with great clarity if you have a uh, million dollars in the bank account. You will find yourself just investing and doing things. You know, the more money you have, the more bad decisions you make. You want to at least start the company with not so much money. At least to, you know, for some time to make sure that the company is in the right track, that your funnel makes sense, and then start seeking uh, bigger amounts of investment. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so my question is based on the market. Uh, let's say um, we have a solution and, um, sorry, uh, we have a problem and the solution to it is not an accurate solution but it acts like a bandage. Bandage. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, you can say like the, uh, the company already started to execute it and uh, it already gained customers. Mm. But now, like, the demand has increased mm. uh, based from the customer side. But these were not the customers that the company was looking for. They were targeting some other mm. uh, different type of audience, but they got a different one. Perfect. That's so a, in this that's case... That's the perfect time to, to pivot. Yeah, so in this case, what's the right um, a path to be taken? Do they go, should they go back to, like, to their um, the targeted audience, or should they continue with the current audience? No, no, you should, you should be... You should as a startup, you're exploring the market. You don't know what the market is, sure. right? You have an idea. You need to validate this idea. Sure. You, know, you know how they say there's a scientific method, right? You start with an assumption, and then by the end of the, of, of the experiment, you say that this assumption was valid or invalid. If it's valid, mm -hmm. perfect. Let's, let's proceed 
to the next experiment. If it's invalid, then you have to go back and, and see what you learned, right? So in the beginning, you assumed that segment A is your target segment based on your own assumption, right? Mm -hmm. But then when you put the mark, when you put the product into the mass market, a thousand other customers thought otherwise. Do you, do you prioritize your own mind as one founder or the 1,000 people who are actually the, the end users? Uh, obviously the widespread mass users. Then, then you just need to pivot. You just need to pivot. Okay, so um, best, um, I fear like, in, like at some point in the future, like if I go with the current existing customers, like they would be asking for an actual solution rather than just a Band-Aid. So there will be a demand for, okay, what's the actual solution is? And we know that the actual solution is too hard to achieve, that it will require a huge resource. Well, I mean, if you want to, if you want a good company, then you should, you should opt in for the challenge. I mean, it seems to me that you're in a better position now that your customers are asking you for stuff. That's where you want to be. The best company is a company that the market is pulling rather than a company that is pushing itself onto the market, mm -hmm. right? If you're receiving that pull from the market, then you're in the best position ever. You just need to make sure that you are serious enough in approaching this opportunity or not. Do you want it or do you not want it? Sure. If you want it, then you just, you just do it. Companies grow and, and succeed because they do the groundwork. The groundwork is ugly, right? No one wants to do the groundwork. Absolutely. Right? But because you've done the groundwork and no one else wants to do it, everyone rather would rather use a finished product and you're just making that finished product available for them, then everyone will use it. Okay, uh, and the other the second question which I'm gonna ask is like, it's completely a bit different. Let's say you have a market for a, uh, a product meant for certain customers, and uh, these are the only customers that will benefit from it. But these are the customers that are not available easily. Hmm. Uh, what's the right way to reach to them and say them that there is a product that exists and that will solve the problem which you are facing? Why, why would they not be reachable easily? Uh, maybe they have uh, like minimal access to resources, let's say social media. Okay, then, then it's, a, it's a question of the, big, the, the size of the market. Is the size of the market big enough? Is it justifiable? Uh, yes, it is. How would you know? I mean, if, they, if there's this barrier to entry, barrier to, uh, to, to actually acquiring a customer, it, it's, you can say it's an assumption, but you can say, yeah, it's, it's an assumption, but yeah, maybe it can be like, let's say 20% less or 20% more, but it's an assumption. Yeah, you, just, you just need to manage things. You just need to just explore. I don't know. I, 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 I will need more details for, for okay. me to be able to advise. But you just, you just explore your options. Normally, where you, where you feel the most pull, that's where you want to be. Because the customer knows what they want, right? And make a distinction between what the customer says and how the customer behaves. Forget, forget about what they say. Just observe what they do. Because you know, it goes back to how conscious we are about what we want. The reality is we're not. The conscious mind is something, and the subconscious is everything, right? Subconscious knows exactly your needs, what you lack, and it decides how you behave and how you how you interact with and how you, how you use a, a product. or So you want to observe that. Sure. You want to do usability tests. You want to ask questions. So don't take uh, anything the customer says at face value. Try to dig deeper and understand the underlying needs that the customer is trying to communicate. Yeah? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. But on the last note, uh, a very last question. Uh, what if um, you have an idea and uh, you think um, this is a solution for it, but you are not in a good position to like start as a team, or like you don't have the resources. But you have an option to get the uh, availability or help from online resources, like online platforms. So I, I have a general uh, idea that I I think is correct. Some other people might think is wrong. I think in the startup world, if you're half in, half out, then your failure is guaranteed. If you're all in, then your success is probable, mm. right? But uh, even if like I would love to you know, like try it out, even if like it says it's a failure, I'll learn from my mistake. 
then then you're not uh, building a company with uh, with 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 the goal of making it a successful company. You're just doing an experiment for you to learn from. Mm. Fine. That's that's your top level KPI. Okay. Once you've achieved it, you've achieved it. Close the company. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're so we are going to have to wrap up now. Badr, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Tap Payments for partnering with us to have uh, to continue to have these events. Uh, we have snacks and peach iced tea from Q Cafe uh, in the corner there. And please help yourselves. Feel free to mingle. Badr may be around for a bit longer if you want to ask him any more. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Badr.